When the war in Afghanistan was blessed by America against the Soviets in the 80s and 90s, the fatwas supporting jihad were pouring in like rain. The khutab were inspiring people to go to jihad. The money was openly collected for jihad and mujahideen. Used to go to any airline, any Saudi airlines branch. Say, I'm going to Pakistan to go fight in Afghanistan. They say half the ticket is off. The ones who returned to visit their families were heroes. Because America blessed it. When it's not blessed by America, the fatwa is it's fitna. Stay away. Their khawarij to scare the ummah from them. The examples of their betrayal are many. All praises for Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who, ha who has saved us from all the misguided beliefs and paths and he has guided us to the deen of Islam, the deen of Haqq, the deen of truth which calls us to reject all false deities, to reject all those that are worship and worshipped, obeyed and followed besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to single him out exclusively and worship him exclusively. This deen of ours requires us though, however, to command the good and forbid the evil. And it is a deen which calls for justice and tranquility and forbids us from all forms of munkarat, all forms of evil. Many Muslims nowadays are striving and working hard to call Muslims to establish the Sharia ah and to abide by it. And many Muslims as well are living in the West, are actively inviting the disbelievers to Islam, alhamdulillah. But obviously there are many obstacles that we will face along the way. And some of those obstacles are the fact that uh, or is the fact that we are living by man-made law everywhere in the world there is man-made law there is atheism, Marxism and secularism is very rife and despite the struggle taking place there are all kinds of propaganda that we are facing as well but one of the most severest or greatest tests that we are facing nowadays is this idea of interfaith and it's unfortunately becoming accepted a lot of Muslims nowadays are starting to accept this idea of interfaith and they believe it's something good. However, I started last week by speaking about, by introducing the topic and inshallah there will be another two more sessions including this one. What we need to understand is that interfaith uh, in a nutshell places both Islam and Kufr on the same platform. And it is the da'wah of the disbelievers, that is something I explained last week, that interfaith is not the da'wah of the missionary Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is not something which Allah calls to. Rather, it is the da'wah of the disbelievers, the Jews and the Christians. And it is their strategy um, of preventing people from coming back to Islam and turning to Islam in masses. And practicing the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who oppose this idea of interfaith, they are branded as extremists and fanatics and even terrorists. And those Muslims who reject it are accused of being um, brainwashed or fanatical. However, we will deal with this inshallah as the time comes. And I mentioned to you last week that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran what is the main objective of the disbelievers. He tells us, and I mentioned this verse last week in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 217. Allah says, that they will never stop fighting you until they make you apostates. And also in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 89, Allah says, They wish that you become a kafir like them, or they wish that you become disbelievers like them, so that you become equal. So this is the main objective of the disbelievers. Even if they tell you otherwise, you have to bear this in mind. 
Because a lot of Muslims, unfortunately, they will say they will disagree. They will say, no, 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 that's, that, that can't be the case. My friend Bob or my friend Tommy, or if it's a woman, my friend Claire, or whatever it is, she doesn't, she doesn't say that to me. But these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whose words are you going to take? The words of your disbelieving colleague or the words of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the Jews and Christians, through this plot of interfaith, are targeting to take you outside the fold of Islam. And they want to abolish completely any idea of al-wala wal bara. Al-wala mean, means having loyalty and love and allegiance and to associate with the believers. And al bara means to disassociate, keep away from and to have hatred as well from those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Christians, they have this idea of loving everybody. Love your neighbor, love your cat, love your dog, love shaitan, love your enemy, love thy enemy. They believe in loving everybody. And even this goes against our fitrah. Because if you ask a Christian, okay, so should I love a pedophile then? He'll say, well, yeah, you've you got to love a pedophile. If he's a war about a rapist, well, yeah, you've got to love a rapist. And if you say to him, what if this guy, you know, if it happened, if you were affected by this, Someone in your family, well, you know, you've got to love him. They, they become stuck. They've got to admit it now because they say, love everybody. They've, they, got, they have to admit it. They say, oh, well, what about the devil then? What about shaitan? Yes, you've got to love him. So in Islam, we don't have this. We don't have this kind of extreme love for everybody and everything. We love for the sake of Allah and we hate for the sake of Allah. So we have both. We love and we hate. And our love and our hatred is not based upon our desire. We love purely for the sake of Allah, those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to love. And this is one of the reasons why Christianity doesn't wash with a lot of people. A lot of people don't accept it because there's so many contradictions. And that is one of the most fundamental contradictions that how can you possibly love everybody and everything? It doesn't, everybody has enemies, everybody has dislikes. So even the Jews and Christians, they hate this idea of Muslim nation and Kufr nations. This is something they want to abolish as well. And the idea that there is a Muslim nation and there is a Kafir nation, but obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us otherwise. And they want to as well abolish this idea that there is an, a monopoly of the truth. That a group of people, namely Muslims, they can, they have the truth with them. Rather their idea of interfaith is to promote this idea that nobody is really on the right path. Jews and Christians and Muslims, they are all correct, they are all Abrahamic, they are all, um, they all lead to God. And they, unfortunately, they chant a lot of slogans, uh, slogans, and Muslims fall for these. And you can see that many of these Jews and Christians who believe in interfaith, and they promote it, and they encourage it, and they call Muslims to it, they are spending a lot of money holding conferences and lectures. And in fact, you will see, or if you go to some mosques, the Muslims are not allowed to speak there. Muslims are not allowed to speak out against what is happening in the world today, but Christians and Jews are welcome to come there and propagate their, their kufr and their shirk. And they're happy with that. So these Jews and Christians are spending a lot of money holding conferences, um, establishing uh, organizations and projects and funding projects in order to mislead the Muslims and to call them to interface. And in fact, it's reached such an extent that they even try to compile this book called the Holy Book. One of their agendas, one of their plans is to compile the Quran and the Torah and the Bible in the form of one book. To com compile all three books as one big holy book. And even if you, if you look at some, uh, some airports and some hospitals, they have something called an interfaith room. Where they encourage people to basically uh, pray in that room all together, coll collectively. Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, Freaks, whatever you want to call it. They are all there in one room and they call them multi-faith rooms. And obviously the scholars have spoken about these kind of rooms that if there's an interfaith room and everyone's worshipping in the same room, then that is something which is forbidden. And if you, if you come across that scenario in the airport or in a hospital, it's better for you to pray somewhere else, not to pray in that room. So... We need to explain this issue of interfaith because it is apostasy from Islam, it is kufr. And as Muslims we are obliged to command the good and forbid the evil and speak out against this munkar. So today I'm going to speak about the reality of interfaith and also the history, a brief history about it. 
And then next week, inshallah, I'm going to finish with a topic by talking about the Islamic verdict on, on interfaith. But before I do that, we need to understand a few facts. Firstly, that many people say that in relation to this idea of interfaith, many Muslims as well, unfortunately, believe that we all have the same God. Muslims, Jews and Christians, we all have the same God. This is not correct. Okay, this is not correct because even though we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator and he created everything and everyone, the reality is that we do not have the same God. Because the God that Christians worship, for example, has a son. Do you understand? So the God, according to the Christians, the God that they worship has a son. Or they believe that he is part of three, a trinity. So how can someone say that we have the same God? When the God that they worship, they believe that he has a son. This is incorrect. Secondly, the idea that Islam is peace, again, this is, this is incorrect as well. The very meaning of Islam I explained last week was that it comes from the word Istislam. Asluhu, as Imam Al-Tabari, I believe, said, he said that the, the asl of Islam is Al-Istislam. Its root is Istislam, which means submission. Thirdly, we need to understand that to... Um, if there, if there is a gathering and prayer taking place together in the same room, then that is not, uh, that is not permissible between all, all kinds of religions. Meaning that if there is a gathering between Muslims, Christians and Jews and they are all worshipping there, that is not allowed. Okay? Because that is exactly what interfaith is calling for. So for everyone to compromise their beliefs and come together and, and, and participate together. And that's why, I don't know if you've seen, but there are some videos you can see on YouTube. And there are some events that people have. Like for example, every anniversary of 9-11, you will find that Muslims come together in the church. Muslims, Christians and Jews. And they will all together offer their worship in the church. And they will, you know, they will um, remember the victims of 9-11. Of and these kind of gatherings are completely forbidden in Islam. However, what we need to understand is that the, the issue of interfaith is that many Muslims try to justify it by saying that all it is is dialogue. It's a platform to discuss with the Jews and Christians. But this is completely incorrect because like I said to you, the, the interfaith call is the call of the Kuffar. It doesn't, it's not from Islam, it's not the call of Tawheed. However, there's nothing wrong with discussing with them. And debating with them. In fact, that is something good. Why not discuss with the Jews and Christians? Why not debate them? But we do not debate them on their platforms. We do not debate them on the issues when they call us to, to become equal like them. And to accept their ideas and values. That is where it is not da'wah anymore. Rather, our da'wah should be to call them to leave their worship of false gods. To, sur to give up this idea of shirk and kufr. And to accept Islam exclusively. So I'm going to speak about very briefly today, inshallah, the history of interfaith. First of all, I want to talk about in the time of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what the Jews and Christians did in his time. First of all, the Jews and Christians, the, Christ, the Christians particularly in the time of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came to him and they said to him, we are the people of paradise, we are Ahlul Jannah, we are the people of paradise. And we come from the same source, we come from Isa and Musa. So let us work together. Let us be brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse in the Quran, chapter number 2, verse 109. Allah says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا Allah says, many of the people of the scripture, the people of the book, أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ The majority of those people from أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ they wish that you would become kafir after your iman. Hasadam min indi anfuzihim. Out of envy. Out of envy towards you. This is what I was speaking about last week. How the Jews and Christians, they envy your deen and they envy your, your tranquility. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with iman. And that he has blessed you with a perfect way of life. And he's blessed you with the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and with the sharia and with the best guidance. Out of envy, they wish that you would become kafir like them. 
So the Christians claimed to be the people of paradise in the time of the Prophet Even in his time they tried to they call for interfaith That we are all the people of paradise, let us work together And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed uh, another verse explaining, explaining their claim Allah says وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا They said, the Christians said or the Jews and Christians said No one will enter paradise unless he be a Jew or Christian This was their claim to the Prophet They went to Rasulullah and they said to him No one will enter لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ No one will enter paradise إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا Except the one who is Jew or the one who is Christian And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is their own desires That is their wish قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Bring your evidence, bring your proof if you are truthful So even in the time of the Prophet wasallam, they came with the interfaith idea Another plan they came with is the idea in the time of the Prophet wasallam. Is the idea that all the, um, the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews, they are all part of an Abrahamic belief. So the Christians came to Rasulullah and they said to him, Did you know that we are Abrahamic? We are on the same millah as you. And we come from Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we are the children of Ishaq. And they said that we, we, are, we descended from Yusuf السلام, and Musa and Dawood and Sulaiman, we are their children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed uh, chapter number 3 verse number 68, he revealed this uh, verse. That verily among mankind who have the best claim to Ibrahim are those who followed him. And this Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in other words, the Muslims have the best, have the most right to claim uh, to be followers of Ibrahim السلام, not the Jews and the Christians. So this was a, a, a lie from, from them at that time. And also, like I mentioned as well, in another verse, chapter number 2, verse 135, Allah says, وَقَالُوا كُونُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا تَهْدَدُوا They used to say to the Prophet and the believers, become a Jew and Christian and you will be guided. You will be on guidance. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ بَلْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا No, verily the, the, the religion of Ibrahim is Hanif, it's monotheistic. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And he was not one of the mushrikeen. So this was the first one I mentioned, Surah number 3, verse 68. And then this one was Surah number 2, verse 135. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly exposed the plots of the Jews and Christians, even in the time of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So after this era, after the after the first three generations of Islam, they started with a new campaign. There was a new plot. So between, for example, the fourth century or Hijra and the eighth century, they came out again. The Jews and Christians, claiming to be the brothers of the Muslims. So, but in that time, when it came back out again, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with it, it came back after the, after about 300 years Hijra, it started to, the call for interface started to emerge, uh, come out again. And this time, the Jews and Christians tried to claim that Christianity and Judaism and Islam, they are all Madhabullah, they are all the Madhab of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they are all his school of thought, and they are all correct. So this, this was their claim this time, they tried it from a different angle. And even in this era, this is when the idea of Wahdatul Wujud came out. And this is something that is propagated by Sufis. Sufis believe in this, extreme Sufis, they believe in Wahdatul Wujud. That um, all of the creations and Allah, they are all one, one entity. Allah and His creations, they are all one entity. And there's nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of the creation, they are all part of Allah, and Allah is part of them. And obviously, this led to a lot of apostasy in that time. A lot of ulama made takfir on them, and many of them were, were executed. But what isn't surprising is the fact that where it came from. Where did, it, where did these ideas come from? Surprise, surprise. They came from the Shia and from the Sufis of Bilad al-Sham and Persia. 
So they started to claim that, there's, that all these three religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam, they are all madhab of, of Allah, madhab Allah. And that was, that was their claim. And uh, a, lot, a lot of ulama, they rose against them and wrote about, um, wrote about them, um, such as for example, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote about um, these schools of thoughts, the, the Sufis and the Shia, and this idea of Wahdatul Wujud. And um, in particular, for example, there was um, one of them called Al-Hallaj, and he was executed by the Khalifa in his time. Unfortunately, the problem that we have nowadays is that because we have no Khalifa, because we have no Islamic State, you will find a lot of hyenas coming out, a lot of chimpanzees and monkeys coming out, jumping up and down, committing kufr and shirk on a daily basis, and there's no one there to protect the deen, no one there to punish these people, no one there to take them forcibly by the hand and stop their munkar. And that is why you find that these ideas of interfaith and the Sufi heretical beliefs are spreading all over the place because there is no Sultan to punish these people like there was in the past. That's why in the past it was so restricted because when it reached the Khalifa's ears, he would grab them and he would punish them. They would deal with these issues, but now we don't have that. So in this era, they came towards the end of the third century, towards the end of the third century. The, the Jews came out with a new idea. They went to the Khalifa Al-Muntasir. The Jews went to the Khalifa Al-Muntasir just towards the end of the third century. And they said to the Khalifa at the time, they said Muhammad has written a letter to our forefathers at the time of Khaybar. Okay? So the Jews went to the, Prof uh, sorry, the, Jews went to the Khalifa Al-Muntasir in his time and they said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has written a letter to our forefathers at the time of Khaybar. In the time of Khaybar, the Jews were destroyed. They were killed. But some of the Jews were forgiven and Muhammad wrote a letter excusing them from paying jizya. Can you believe it? This is what the Jews did in the time of Al-Muntasir. They claimed that they had a letter that was signed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in that letter, the Prophet says that the Jews will no longer need to pay jizya. Can you believe it? This was their trick. They claim that the Prophet said, you will not need to pay jizya anymore. You are excused for, from it forever. So obviously, the letter was written on gazelle skin. And there were no vowel marks, so it looked very traditional, very um, old. And also, it, it was signed, it had a signature of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And according to this document, it was witnessed by Al uh, by Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anhu That's right Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anhu may Allah be pleased with Muawiyah It was signed by Muawiyah and also Sa'ad bin Mu'adh they they witnessed this document according to the Jews And it seemed genuine but however the Khalifa he called Imam At-Tabari Imam al-Tabari, as you know, the very famous uh, Mufassir, Imam al-Tabari. So the Khalifa had Imam al-Tabari, great alim in his time. So he called Imam al-Tabari to, to examine the document. When Imam al-Tabari saw it, he said, this is a fake. This has been forged. And he said, Imam al-Tabari said, it is impossible for this document to be authentic because it was signed by Muawiyah when he wasn't even Muslim in the, in the time of Khaybar. So the Jews were caught out. He embraced, Imam al-Tabri said that he embraced Islam two years later when the Prophet conquered Mecca. So subhanAllah, Imam al-Tabri was very shrewd. The Jews brought this document that was signed by the Prophet and witnessed by Muawiyah in the time of Khaybar. But Imam al-Tabri was very sharp. He said, this is fake. Because Muawiyah was not a Muslim at that time. He became a Muslim two years later. So they were exposed. So they tried it with the, the document of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another tr attempt they tried is with the document of St. Catherine. Okay, the document on, of St. Catherine. St. Catherine was a saint, a Christian saint. And I believe she, she died uh, around about 300 common era. Okay, 300 common era. And she was buried in <clears throat> uh, Mount Sinai, where Musa السلام, received the Ten Commandments. So the Christians, 
they used to call people to worship at their monastery, the monastery of St. Catherine. Especially the Pope and the Christian Coptics. And they claimed, okay, and you can check this out yourself. You know, by all means, don't take what I'm saying. If you don't want to take what I'm saying, you don't have to take it, but do your own research if you like. But that monastery is still there today in Egypt, Mount Sinai. It's called St. Catherine Monastery. And the, the Christians claimed in this area, around about towards the end of the 3rd century Hijrah, they claimed that they had a letter or document that was signed by the Prophet wasallam, And it was witnessed in front of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And this document apparently said that Allah told the Messenger Muhammad that there is a grave at that monastery that belongs to a saint called Catherine. And the document was signed in the year 3 by Abu Huraira, year 3 Hijrah. So obviously, this claim went to the Khalifa again. So the Khalifa was shown this document. The, the, the Christians came to the Khalifa and they said, Look, we have this document. It is signed by your Prophet, by Muhammad. It was witnessed by Abu Huraira. It's a document on St. Catherine. And it says that Muslims should basically go and pay respect to the monastery. The St. Catherine Monastery in Mount Sinai. So this was shown to the Khalifa, the governor, sorry, the governor of Egypt. And he was shocked, so he called the ulama to investigate the document. And obviously if it was true, then that would have serious implications. To go there and, and that Muslims should actually worship in that place. However, when the governor was shown this letter and he took it to the ulama, the ulama immediately exposed it as a fake. How? How did they know it was a fake? Because Abu Huraira could not have testified um, to that document, to that signing, because he was not Muslim in that year, again. And they, they say that it was signed on the year 3 Hijrah, but Abu Huraira did not become a Muslim until year 6. So that was, they were exposed there again. However, unfortunately, that document is still around. In fact, if you, if you look online, and you can, you can do a quick Google search, if you, if you search for document of St. Catherine, they still claim, in fact, it is in the monastery, and it is framed as well. They claim that they have a letter that has the handprint of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, uh, in Egypt as well, is a hardcore place of interfaith. And that monastery is visited every year by Muslims, Christians and Jews. And in fact, even within the perimeter of the monastery, there is a mosque as well. They built a mosque there as well. So it's, it's a place where Muslims and Christians are worshipping there every year. And this is how they've been misled by, by, the, by the Jews and Christians forging this letter, claiming that it was signed by the Prophet wasallam. So many Muslims go there to go and see this letter and to also worship there. And they should know that this is kufr to uh, answer the call of interfaith. In the same era, another plot was the plot of Sufism. Again, I mentioned that to you briefly, the Madhab of Allah. This was the claim of the Sufis. Um, the Jews came from the angle that there are that you have um, many schools of thoughts. So this is what the Jews said to the Muslims that you have many schools of thoughts amongst you. What about the school of thought of Allah? What about Mathab of uh, what about the Mathab of Allah? And this is where the Mathab idea started. The Mathab of, of Allah started from the Jews and Christians. And obviously the Sufis were the ones who were gullible enough to accept the idea, and they thought it was a great idea. So this was in that in that era. The next era in the time of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. and this was between uh, 800 uh, sorry the 8th century and the 10th century okay between the 8th and the 10th century they came back again the Jews and Christians and they tr they tried another tactic obviously this this era era was known as the Abbasid uh, Khilafah in that time and in Bilad al-Sham which is uh, Syria and Palestine Bilad al-Sham was known as, as having the cities of knowledge. The people in Bilad al-Sham in Syria, in Damascus, they were so busy studying and seeking knowledge. In fact, people were so busy studying that no one, even had, no one was even prepared to fight. There were, there were no weapons in, 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 in Bilad al-Sham at, at the time. No weapons. Because the people were so busy with studying and seeking ilm and knowledge. And 
in this time, there was a there was a scholar called there was an Imam called Al Al Mansuri. Al Mansuri, he clashed with some ulama, some scholars. He had a dispute with them because he couldn't reach a status. He couldn't reach the Khalifa at the time or the Amir of Baghdad. Okay, he wanted to go there and he wanted he wanted position within the state, but he couldn't get to that position. So the Jews, they saw Al Mansuri, they saw how badly he wanted to be a leader or he wanted to be in a position of power and leadership. So the Jews came to him and they were praising him and they, uh, they said to him, we can help you get into a position, but we need you to help us. So the Jews said that the Tartars, okay, they have a big army outside the city of Dimashq, the city of Damascus. They are ready to enter Bilad al-Sham. But if they embrace Islam, they could enter the city without fighting. And this will uh, make you close to the governor. So obviously the Jews came to Al-Mansuri and they said that the, the Tartars are ready to enter. They're going to fight and they're going to kill people. But if you go out there and get them to embrace Islam, the governor will be really impressed with you. So Al-Mansuri, he went to the governor and he said, remember this is the time of Ibn Taymiyyah. So Ibn Taymiyyah was alive at the time. Al-Mansuri went to the governor and he said, I want to go to the Tartars and call them to embrace Islam. So the governor gave him permission. So when he went out of the city, he met the leader of the Tartars, who was known as uh, Qazan. And he said to him, al Mansuri said to Qazan, the leader, leader of the Tartars, he said to him, you don't need to fight to enter Damascus. You don't need to fight. If you embrace Islam, you can enter Damascus without fighting. And he said, we have a secret. The people of Sham have a secret. And Qazan said, what is it? What, what's your secret? He said, if you embrace Islam and give me power, when you enter the city, I'll tell you. So Qazan, he decided to embrace Islam and he called himself Mahmud. So Qazan, who was the leader of the Tartars, he embraced Islam and changed his name to Mahmud. So the news spread and everyone in Bilal al-Sham knew that obviously the, the Tartars were ready to enter and kill Muslims. But the news spread that the leader of the Tartars had embraced Islam at the hands of Al-Mansuri. So the Tartars were, were, were ready to enter Damasc Damascus and the governor called all the ulama and asked for advice. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Ibn Taymiyyah Ibn Taymiyyah said, he goes, wait a minute, let me check if they've really become Muslim or not. Let me go and check. So he went with his students to meet Qazan. And when they went to meet him, they discovered that the Tartars were actually taking parts of Islam and they were mixing it with their own book, Al Yasiq. So Ibn Taymiyyah was very shocked. The Al Mansuri came back and said, that these people have embraced Islam. But when Ibn Taymiyyah went to verify with them and check, he found that they were, they were following Islam and also their book called Al Yasiq. And he saw them praying and doing ritual acts, but they were also referring to the book Al Yasiq. So Ibn Taymiyyah said, he goes, these people are kuffar, even if you see them praying, they are not Muslim, subhanAllah. Can you believe it? Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, when he saw this, he said, these people are kafir. He saw them praying. He saw them engaging in ritual acts. But he said, they are disbelievers because they are following al yasiq They are following their own customs and traditions. I wonder if Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was alive today, what he would say about those Muslims who claim to be Muslim and they pray and they fast, but they call for democracy and they call for secularism and they call for nationalism and they live by their own laws and their own constitutions. I wonder what Ibn Taymiyyah would say about them. No doubt he would say the same thing. Because they are doing exactly what um, Qazan or the so-called Mahmud was doing. That they were following Islam, they were praying, doing, doing ritual acts. But politically, what laws were they living by? They were living by al Yasiq. So Ibn Taymiyyah said these people are kuffar, they are disbelievers. However, Al-Mansuri, he disagreed with Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, no, they are Muslims. Even if they follow this book, they don't take it into their belief. Okay, so they are still Muslim. So Al-Mansuri went to Qazan and he said to him, 
Al Mansuri said to Qazan, he said, do you, know, do you want to know a secret? Let me tell you a secret about Bilad al Sham. He said, the secret is that they have no weapons whatsoever. SubhanAllah, can you believe this, this super grass, this niche, Al Mansuri? He went to Qazan and he said to him, he gave away the secret of the Muslims. He said, they have no weapons whatsoever. So obviously, Qazan was very intrigued. And at this, at this point, the Tatars decided that they're going to enter the city. But when the news spread that the Tatars were going to invade and they were going to enter, because the Tatars knew that there were no weapons, most of the ulama, they said, you know what they said? They said, let us make a treaty with them and surrender the city without fighting. Otherwise, they will harm our women and children. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, by Allah, these people are mushriks and we have weapons. I can train you all. So Ibn Taymiyyah said, no, we have weapons. I'll train you all. We have three things, three weapons. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have our Iman and we have our Tawakkul. And we have our nails and our nails, our fingernails are enough. Are enough with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, this is how Ibn Taymiyyah was optimistic. He was not a defeatist like the other ulama. However, the, the, those defeatist ulama, they replied, they said, let us have a look at the cause of victory. Iman is not enough. Iman is not enough. We need to be trained and have weapons. Ibn Taymiyyah uh, rahimahullah said that the Prophet in the battle of Badr had only one horse. We have many horses. And the horses are linked to goodness. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, you can see how optimistic he was and he understood he had the right aqidah that we have enough, we have our iman, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have tawakkul and we have our fingernails, we will claw their faces, we will poke their eyes out, we will take out their organs with our very hands. This was the mentality of Ibn Taymiyyah. And he said as well that they may have horses because the ulama replied, yes, the ulama replied, they said, yes, we have horses, but they have horses as well. Ibn Taymiyyah replied that they have horses, but they do not have horses with soldiers on top of them that say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So the Amir instructed Ibn Taymiyyah to take charge of the mission. And Ibn Taymiyyah started to go around and motivate the people. He started to tell them about the weapons that they should use, about the Iman and the Tawakkul. He started to teach them the Aqeedah and the Tawheed, Al Wala wal Bara and to depend on, on, on Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Al-Mansuri on the other hand, what was he doing? He was going around to everyone, demotivating them, telling them, no, you can't, don't listen to Ibn Taymiyyah. Don't listen to Ibn Taymiyyah, these people are Muslim, they are not kafir. So Mansuri, Al-Mansuri was doing the complete opposite. And he was saying that Allah says, do not fight, the, um, they, are, they are Muslim, so we should not fight them. But Ibn Taymiyyah was going around saying that these people are kafir and even if you see them in the mosques, kill them. This was what the, the response of Ibn Taymiyyah. So the Tartars, they became so strong that one night Ibn Taymiyyah decided to investigate. So he went to the camp of Qazan and when he went to the camp in the night time, he went, Ibn Taymiyyah went in the night time to the camp of the Tartars to go and see Qazan. And when he went there, you know who he found? He found Al-Mansuri there. Suddenly, Ibn Taymiyyah, he realized what, what, what's going on. He realized now that basically there's the, a the snitch. Okay, and he realized that the snitch is Al-Mansuri. He was the leak. So Qazan saw Ibn Taymiyyah and he said, he said, who are you? Ibn Taymiyyah said, I am Ibn Taymiyyah, Abdullah Ibn Taymiyyah. So they started to argue about whether the Tartars were Muslim or not. Ibn Taymiyyah argued that you cannot be, he was arguing with Qazan, he said, you cannot be a Muslim and follow this book, al Yasiq. You have to give up, otherwise we will fight you. Okay? So then, Qazan said to him, what do you want from us? Ibn Taymiyyah said, I want two things. You have to correct your aqidah and know that Muslims do not fight Muslims. Meaning, that if you correct your aqidah and you embrace Islam properly, then we won't fight you. Qazan said, well, if we don't do that, what will you do? Ibn Taymiyyah re replied, 
Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah replied, he goes, no, that if you, if you do not do this, we will fight you. Each one of us will take ten of your men. And we are people with weapons and we will surprise you. Al-Mansuri, the crook, he jumped in immediately and he said, you have no weapons, you are bluffing. Can you believe it? This was Al-Mansuri in front of Qazan, in front of Ibn Taymiyyah. He said to Ibn Taymiyyah, you are bluffing, you have no weapons. Ibn Taymiyyah replied to Al-Mansuri, he said, we have weapons, but we do not tell you because we knew that you would deceive us one day. We have more weapons than the hairs on your head, on your beard, sorry. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah said to um, Al-Mansuri. So Qazan brought Ibn Taymiyyah and his companions meat to eat. He said, okay, let me feed you. Let's, let's talk a bit more. But Ibn Taymiyyah, his, his wala and bara is very clear. He said, I will never eat the meat of a mushrik. Anyway, Qazan, he agreed to um, withdraw from Dimashq, from Damascus. So Ibn Taymiyyah returned victorious without fighting or even giving salam. He never even gave him salam. He never even ate his meat. He never compromised his deen at all. Yet he returned victorious without, to do, without any fighting as well, without to even eat their meat, without to give them salam. Whereas Al-Mansuri, after compromising his deen and selling out and, selling, and giving the secrets of the Muslims to the kuffar, Qazan killed him. Subhanallah. And you know, nowadays, we have a lot of Mansouris nowadays, a lot of them. The majority of our Imams and scholars, they are like Mansouri today. Those Imams today are like Al-Mansouri. Wallahi, they go around demotiv uh, demotivating, um, pointing doubts in the minds of the Muslims and claiming that we have no strength and no power and we are in a time of weakness for how long are we going to be in time of weakness? for the last 10 years they've been saying we are in weakness for 20 years, for 30 years they've been saying we are in a time of weakness we can't do anything for how long are we going to be weak? for how long, for how many years? and we have so many Mansouris like this today and we don't have very many shuyukh or ulama like Ibn Taymiyyah rahmahullah Nowadays you will find that instead of calling for the jihad against the kuffar, the Christians, crusaders and the apostates, you will find that they are defending them, issuing fatwas, calling for Muslims to obey their leaders and even to join the army of the kuffar, the American forces and the British forces and even to commemorate them, to wear a poppy to mourn their dead. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And these are the Imams who claim to be the Imams of interfaith. They are the ones who are calling for interfaith. So you need to be aware of these people. Anyway, after the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, I realize my time is running out, inshallah, I want to finish now. After the time of Ibn Taymiyyah, there was the era of um, uh, the 10th century, between the 10th and the 14th century. Okay, between the 10th and the 14th century, um, you had a number, of, a number of other interfaith movements. And obviously, in this time, between the 10th and the 14th century, you had this group called the Freemasons, which came out. And they were established by the Jews, the Freemasons. And the Freemasons, actually, they believe that, in, in fact, to, to be a member of the Freemasons, you have to accept all religions. This is well known. To be a member of a Freemason, the, the Freemasons, you have to accept all religions. And you have to worship at, at all places of worship. You have to worship at mosques. Um, you, have to, or you have to accept the idea of worshipping at mosques, at synagogues, at churches, at temples, uh, you know, at churches, wherever it is, you have to accept this idea. So another, this idea of Freemasons, again, was, is another plot of interfaith. And a number of Muslims started to accept this idea, such as, for example, Jamal, uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. He was very famous, someone who accepted this idea of Freemasons. And he died in Turkey as well. And there was also a man in Egypt called uh, Muhammad Abdu. Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, he was again someone who accepted, this, accepted and propagated this idea of uh, um, all the religions are acceptable. And also he, um, 
they accepted the idea of uh, the Freemasons' idea. And finally, there is the era of this time, the time that we are in today. Um, from, from the time of the destruction of the Khilafah, from that time onwards, or even just before that actually, there's a new, obviously interfaith has, uh, has taken a new kind of face, a new kind of mask, a mask. And obviously you have the Jews and the Christians calling for Muslims, saying that look, um, they're calling for unity between all the Musawiyya, the Jews and the Isawiyya Christians and the Muhammadiyya. They are calling them all to unite. And uh, under the guise, or under the pretext that, all these religions bring you closer to God. And they, they call for people to reject partisanship, meaning that your, your religion is the only truth and everything, you cannot accept this idea. And also they believe in brotherhood in religion, and that they follow the religion of Abraham, and that we should have unity between uh, Al-Adyan, Al-Samawiyya, the, the, the heavenly revealed or divine religions. This is what they call it as well. They say that Islam, Christianity and Judaism are Adyan Samawiyya. They are heavenly or divine um, religions. And also, you will find that they are, like I mentioned to you as well, that they have this new idea that they want to compile all the books, uh, the three main books, the Quran and the Bible and the Torah, and they want to make it into one big holy book. And that is a plan that they've had for a number of years now. I don't know if they've done it yet, but that is something that they are, they are trying to do to compile it all. And unfortunately, you have uh, many Muslims um, uh, that, are, that, that think that this is a good idea. And obviously th there is no difference between this book and also the book of Al-Yasiq, which was the book of the Tartars. And we know that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, who was a great Imam, uh, one of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we know what his view was on those who follow Islam and also they take from the religions of others. And some people, some Muslims have this belief that they believe that we can follow Islam and also take the good and leave the bad. We can take the good things from Christianity, take the good things from Judaism, take the good things from Hinduism and Sikhism and, and, and some of the good things that the atheists do. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله Islam came as the final revelation to, convert, to confirm the previous scriptures and also to abrogate them. You know the scholars, the scholars have said that if someone wants to follow an abrogated verse from the Bible, he's a kafir. An abrogated verse, something that Allah had revealed, and it's, if it's something that Allah had revealed, you know, a genuine verse that, uh, that was revealed by Allah, the scholars, have, the ulama have said that if someone wants to follow that verse, he's a kafir, because you're not, they've, they've all been abrogated now, you don't follow these anymore, we follow the Quran and the Sunnah only, that revelation. So beware uh, of these things and obviously the reason why so many Muslims are falling for this idea of interfaith is because the kuffar, they're using a lot of these slogans like, you know, humanity, freedom, equality, compassion, love, brotherhood, mercy, all these kind of slogans that the, the Muslims are unfortunately falling for, they sound very good, but in actual fact they are leading people to apostasy.
When they call jihad, they call it the Muslim brothers back home no. in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Bilad al Haramain. They say to them, You jihad, you see, we are with it, we support it, we pray for you day and night. Continue your good works. If we are from Al Qaedin here doing nothing, at least ourselves, we will never be tricked of beat. At least we will never let you down. At least we will always make dua for you and we will always support you by all what we can. So the call for jihad is to go back all the way to Fallujah, to go back all the way to Ba'kuba, to go back all the way to Al Qaim, to go back all the way to Afghanistan. That is exactly when the brothers here shouting jihad. At the same time in Uzbekistan, they shouting La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Jihad! Jihad! 